Hunt Suburbia podcast presents the Living Legends series. A special three-part series with deer hunting legend Lanny Benoit. I just want to give a plug to the muzzleloader guys. Oh yeah, well Woodman for sure. They're, they're giving me a muzzleloader too and I'll be uh, hopefully killing it. Maybe that's what we do this year. If you wanted to take me out, we'd go out and with the muzzleloaders. Well, that's, you know, I'm going to tell you what, if you want to become a good deer hunter, I ain't bragging or nothing, but everybody that's ever gone with me, if they got any talent at all, they all end up being a good deer hunter. They shoot deer. Yeah. Uh, even if we don't even go in the woods, just right around, and what happens is, we're going to have this tonight here, but the problem is, I can't remember everything. Yeah. All the stuff that you really need to know. Yeah. Because um, it's a lot of little things. Yeah. Well, hopefully I do a good job in uh, asking you the right questions. That's hopefully... You know, like I shot a buck one time in Maine. It was crunchy snow. I don't have a problem hunting on crunchy snow. But anyways, <laughs> the deer found a... And we can repeat this. The deer finally got got into a doe there. And I'm in them pines. You know, the, the growth pines, the ones they plant. You know, they're only a little taller than the ceiling here. And they grow kind of close. I said to myself, I know that buck's right over there. I know he is. Because I went around that whole pine thing. And I found his track going in. I've been tracking him. I said, you know what? I know he's heard me. I'm going to sit on that rock right there and not make any more noise. And he, I think he lost the doe anyways. Yeah. He's going to come back looking for me, for her, because he heard me. He might think it's her. He's going to be curious. Yeah. Yeah. I sat there and I didn't sit there five minutes. I looked up through the... Pines, I can see him coming. I see, yeah, he's looking for the doe. Oh, he's going to get powder burn in the face. I shot him <laughs> from here to the, the pillow, that right there. Oh, yeah? I sat there, and he come around the tree, and I was already, I was just aiming like this. <laughs> Comes around and looks right at me. I, I felt bad. <laughs> what did that one end up weighing? I don't, uh, yeah. there weren't that big a one. It had decent horns on it. I'm trying yeah. to remember. Around, right around 200. Yeah, yeah. Smaller one for you. Huh? Small one for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Later, earlier <laughs> yeah. in the season, I wouldn't even shot him. It was the last day, and I, I shot him for a friend of mine to give him to him for a deer meat. Nice well, buck, but, you know, it's just stuff like that that gets you deer. Yeah. You know? Well, I guess we should do the intro, even though it's a man that me- needs no introduction, Lanny Benoit. Um, I really appreciate you coming out and, uh, and doing the podcast. A bunch of people requested to have you on. Mutual friend in Timmy Bullduck, who you taught a little bit, right, back in the day. Yep. Yep. And uh, yeah, why don't we talk? Why don't we start start off with just how do you know Timmy? Well, Timmy came to our deer hunting school, and I could tell right off that he, uh, him and his friend there, uh, George. Yep. And both of them turned into being really good deer hunters. I mean, really good. See, some people go to deer hunting school and you go through the whole thing, and they don't teach you a lot. Although we had one in uh, New Brunswick where we took people hunting at the same time, but when they came, it was just in Maine. It was in the spring, so. But you could tell they had a lot of enthusiasm. Yep. And they're smart. And they took to it like, like a beagle going, you know, rabbit hunting. Yeah. And they were. It didn't take them no time. They're shooting big bucks. Yeah. Been shooting every since, I guess. Yeah. Timmy's been having some good years recently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I asked him I, uh, when he did had, did the podcast. I asked him uh, who's the best hunter you know, alive. And he said, Lanny Benoit, like, you know, like that. So, I mean, I think a lot of people think that. Do you think that? Who's the best hunter alive in your opinion? Well, I'm all washed up over the hill 75 and the mountains gotten really steep. So I may be still alive, but I'm definitely not the best deer hunter right now. I can (laughs) tell you that if I ever was. Yeah. So who knows? I'm not going to, you know, I just, but in your prime, I'm sure. There wasn't a buck out there that wasn't afraid of you. Well, let me tell you, when I was in my prime, there was only two things that saved a big buck. Had to be a big river or daylight ended. <laughs> that was a fact. I, I, even a big river didn't always save them, did it? <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> I think you guys used to no, cross I used to those. cut trees and go across, <laughs> whatever it took. Yeah. Well, when we were talking on the phone uh, a couple days ago, Timmy, Timmy introduced us on phone, and uh, you said... You know, I was telling you, oh, it's a podcast. Oh, podcast. Okay, what's that? Well, 
it's going to be an hour and a half or so, probably. An hour and a half, you said. Well, I don't know. I can go all the way back to childhood. So why don't we start with your childhood? <laughs> What, what was it like growing up? Lanny Benoit, you know, Larry is your father, Iris, your mother, right? What, what was it like uh, growing up, and how did you get into hunting? Well, you want me to tell you my first hunting trip? Yeah. My very it. first time I hunted anything? Sure. To eat? Because back when I grew up, that's what we did when we fished and hunted. To, we're going to eat what we hunted, and that's it's even that way today, but it's more so back in the 50s. Yep. Well, I my folks moved to Stowe. And you had to go way back, and this was had to be early 50s. You had to lug water to the house, the house they rented for the time being. Mm-hmm. And I'd go up with my mother, and there was this great big bullfrog up there. <laughs> and she says to me, you know, if you catch that big bullfrog, I'll, I'll cook the legs for you, and you have frog legs. Mm-hmm. But you've got to catch the frog. Well, that frog and I went around for about a month, and I finally got him. But that was my, <laughs> that was my first hunting, hunting deal. Right well, it sounds there. like you kind of had to track him. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't catch that thing. Of course, what was I, four or five years old? Did you get him with a rock? or? How did you I don't even him? remember. I know I finally <laughs> caught him. I still never had frog legs, but uh, no, heard they're good. So Stowe must have been a bit different back then. It was. So anyways, I grew up when, when hunting, even before hunting season started, and there was always a lot of shooting going on. My dad and people would show up, and they're always shooting and different things. And finally, deer hunting would roll around. And, and of course, I couldn't go to sleep because listening to all the deer stories. Yeah. Deer story after deer story and how this big one got away and how they shot a big one over there. And so as I'm growing up, you got to remember now, when I grew up, it was different than it is today. Um, I had a 22 rifle that I, my dad gave me shorts to go hunting squirrels with mm-hmm. back when I was seven years old. Uh, that's kind of young. You, how would you do that today? <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. I shot my first deer probably when I was eight. Well, yeah, they'd, they'd probably haul away the parents for some kind of abuse if you, you saw well, you running around with a gun when you're seven. Well, I shouldn't say this, but, you know, back then, uh, we had two deer seasons. Yeah. Do you remember that? No. Nope. I don't think you would anyways. But you see, we had two weeks of regular, and we had the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> but see, everybody was like that way back in the 50s. Yeah. Because times are hard back then. My dad worked in a mill, and what did he make a week? You know what I mean? Yeah. They didn't even get a dollar an hour, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, if you have heard, that was definitely commonplace back in the day. And there were stories at my deer camp of uh, shooting what you can, when you can, back when the times were tough. But, um, so, so you. So I grew up. Yep. Wanting to become a good deer hunter because it was instilled in me when I was growing up by listening to my uncles and friends. And so, you know, my big dream was to shoot big bucks. And and I was riding my uncle one day over in New Hampshire. And we were going somewhere else and I started talking to him about deer hunting. And I told him, told him right out. I know it sounded like I was bragging even though I was just a little guy. I can't remember. I must have been... 10, 11 or so, 12 maybe. I said, I'm going to shoot a lot of big bucks when I get older. He looked at me and he goes, well, it might seem like you might, but that's a lot harder than what you think. And I looked at him and I just remember this, this is clean up to the bell. I said, no, I'm going to shoot a lot of big bucks. I'm telling you, that's what I'm going to do. Uh-huh. And I did, so. And so, so what do you remember about, um, so you mentioned your uncles and your buddies, you know, what about your dad growing up? How did when did he teach you deer hunting, or, or did he teach you deer hunting? And how how did you first get into it? Well, here's get what on a track? here's what happened was, uh, as I'm growing up and listening to all these guys talk, I started asking questions after a while because I got big enough where you know a, a kid could ask questions, and none of them could really answer to me how you could tell the difference between a buck track and a doe track. Yeah. All I ever heard was, oh, you'll learn how to do it. They didn't get into any more detail than that. That was it. So I thought I was getting pretty good at telling deer buck tracks from doe tracks. And 
I'm standing on the logging road one day because I went hunting with my grandfather on my dad's side. And of course, he was in his 70s, and I assume he was, and I zoomed up the logging road because I was younger, and I got up there quite a ways. I was in my early teens, and I'm looking at this track trying to figure out if it was a bug track or not because I wanted to go chase that thing. He comes along, takes one look at it, and he says, Lanny, go track that thing. That's a buck. Really? Guarantee it. Go get him. Well, I took off, and I didn't track that deer maybe 20 yards, and I can see where he rubbed his antlers on a tree. Yeah. Yep. Well, he knows something I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so what? what is the what is the biggest uh, differentiator? You know, for between a buck and a doe track that you found now, or after all these years. Well, there's a lot of difference between now. Some does have great big feet on them, and you can get really confused by looking at the size of the foot. Well, you know, it's like looking at a woman, most women, anyways, <laughs> walking down the street ahead of you, and you're looking from the back to them. They're built different. Yeah, yeah. Does are built different. Yeah, they got different hips on them. Yeah. A lot of your big buck tracks I got where I can be driving down the road at 40 miles an hour and there's a deer going up over a bank in the snow. You see the snow tracks? I can tell you if it's a big buck or not, just looking at that. Just the width of it this the way. stagger, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, and then you got to remember them deer are like doggies. Some doggies have great big feet when they're puppies and they haven't grown into their feet yet. Mm hmm. So what happens, a lot of people will see a great big buck track there, but it's only a year and a half, two year and a half old buck. He's just got big feet. Hmm. And he's walking on his toes like you used to. Well, I don't know if you're old enough yet, but we all start kind of get flat footed. <laughs> well, that's what bucks do. They get flat footed after they get older. So when what happened was through the years, we'd come back and well, I found a big old flat footer today. And that meant he's an adult deer. He's as big as he's ever going to get, and probably he's got as good a rack as he'll ever have. Yeah. When you see them walking on their, the back of their feet. And you see the dew claws more? Yeah, you do. Yeah. They, they, they walk flatter. Yeah. So you said they'll have a big rack. I know you guys, you know, you want a 200-pounder, and to you the trophy is the weight, but pretty much the bigger the weight buck, they'll have, tend to have nicer headgear on them, right? And, and are antlers important to you or what? Well, when I grew up, antlers weren't, they were all right. Uh, when I grew up, nobody asked what it scored. But you know what they asked? What, what did it weigh? Yeah. Because people were interested in the meat more than they were antlers. Yeah. I mean, they wanted to have a nice rack, but it didn't, nobody ever asked me what the deer, you know, they'd say, well, how many points did it had? And you'd tell them, but what did it weigh? That was the most important thing. Yeah. So what happened was through the years, I shot a lot of big bucks, didn't have much for racks on them because they were big. <laughs> they put all their nutrients into their weight, not their antlers. Huh? I shot some that go, you know, 240 pounds, and he had a rack about that big. But I didn't care because he had a, he was that monster deer. And some of them were real skinny. They probably went 300 when they're in good shape. Wow. So you, um, what's your, uh, what's your biggest buck by weight? Biggest buck I've shot was 272. 272. Didn't have an ounce of fat on him. Yeah. You could put it all in one cup that big. Yeah. And I man. shot a bunch of those like So he that. was over 300. Yeah, <laughs> and then I shot one one year that weighed 268, and he was a butterball, but he was a small deer. Wasn't a big deer. Just tons of fat on him. He was just had fat in his antlers up in here. He had fat <laughs> everywhere. And Shane shot one that year, went 268. And his deer was a foot longer than mine, but he didn't have much fat. <laughs> so... Well, and that's what I hear too. Is the longer the deer, that's where that's where you get the really big ones, right? Yeah, yeah. The length. Yep. So we were talking. Uh, um, I was talking with Mark Woodman and uh, and Timmy a few weeks ago, and um, Mark said he was he did some filming for you uh, for a couple of years there, and he he thought it was you know it stood out that you guys would spend a lot of time in the truck sometimes, right? Driving the old logging roads, and we talk about you know what you're doing there. When, when you're riding around well here's what you do when you go ride around you got to have both things looking at it. like there's places in new hampshire it's all hardwood from the bottom to the top yep well yeah there'll be a big buck going through there here and there but that's not ideal big buck country you got to have a swamp area at the bottom if you got a big swamp area then you'll have some deer going up into the hardwoods 
But if you don't have a good uh, yard area, then you're wasting your time. So what about um, the thick spruce tops, or is that you know? Yep. The same as the swamp area, in your opinion, it's going to hold, you know, hold the cover for them and well, be their there's, bed. There's a lot of big bucks up high that nobody realizes they're way up there, and you may get discouraged when you go up there because you're not going to see much sometimes. Then all of a sudden you'll bounce, bump right into a big buck track, and and if he could still be up there, and don't get discouraged if it's two days old because he could be hanging out up there. I've shot him on top. When the spruces are kind of short up there, where they've been up there for two or three days, or even longer. Yep. The, the track gets fresher and fresher quick. You mentioned, I think it was earlier this morning, um, you chased, uh, so you or did you start following a buck track that was three years old, and then you caught up, I mean, three, three days old, and then you caught up with them that day? Well, the one that was 272 was a day old. Yeah. How'd you know? Just Well, my dad tracked that deer the day before. Okay. He told me it was an awful big deer, but he didn't have big feet. And then you got onto him where your dad stopped? or No, I got onto him where he left him in the woods. Here's what happened was we're driving into where we, he tracked it, and, and I see remnants of a deer track going by. I just glanced at it briefly because... I wanted to go get on the buck that he tracked the day before because he told me it was a really big buck. Well, I tracked that thing for about two hours, crossed the road right where that was the same track. <laughs> <laughs> and he headed to the top. I can tell you exactly where it was. It was up in the um, Appalachian Trail area up in Katahdin Ironworks. I shot him on top of one of them big blue mountains up there. Yep. He just kept going up and up and up, and he got up there and he did the same thing. He just fed over there and fed over here, and and I come sneaking around the spruces. I wasn't making it. Luckily, it was a good spot. It was uh, I could walk with not making any noise. And I come around. He was looking over that way. He was bedded. No, he no. was standing there, chewing. Well, yep. Yeah. Just feeding. feeding. He just happened to be looking that way. Never heard me coming from behind. Um. I shot him. I dragged him for a ways, and I said, that was, that was the first of deer season. And I said, boy, I'm out of shape. I can't drag this deer very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, he weighed a little bit under 300, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I want to bring this up to you. Yeah. Shane in that white book figured up my average for I don't know how many years it was. Yeah, I was going to ask, and I think it was like six years or something. And it was 239 pound average. Yeah, well, it was longer than six years, wasn't it? Yeah, we'll find it. Now, I'm going to, I want to talk about that for a minute. That was neat looking at the stats. Right here. Um, between 89 and 95. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so six years. And it says your stats were uh, your bucks averaged 239.3 pounds and 8.2. Uh, eight point one points. See, I don't think you can do that anymore. No matter what kind of hunter you are, yeah. yeah. No, I believe you there. Yeah. I didn't even know that he figured it up when he did this book. Shane did, but I don't know if you can do that anymore because I don't think the bucks are there. You, you don't mean? think they're there, or that or they're that big? Well, I don't think they're there because they don't have a chance to get big because the way they've cut this, the, cut it off. I mean. That was in the northern part, you know, like above Jackman. Yeah. And that area. Jackman and... And all the way up? Yeah. Green, Greenville. Because that made that whole that whole thing combined. I'm wondering if you could even do that today. What's different about how they're cutting? Well, it's just harder to find a really big buck track now. I mean, there's big bucks around, but not like they used to be. When I first started hunting Maine up there, here's what happened was, when you got there, you didn't wonder if you were going to shoot a big buck. What you wondered was how big it was going to be. <laughs> That's a true story. Yeah. Now you go to Maine, and you wonder if you can even find a big buck track. Yeah. There's a few around, but some years they're just not there. So would you guys take the whole month off of, for for main season or what what did uh what was that like? And I I read in there about the bust and I think I heard um 
on Hal's uh, Big Woods Bucks podcast, they were talking about the legendary bus that you guys use as your camp, you know. When would you guys get to your bus and stay and, you know, uh, well, how long would you stay? Some years I'd take the whole month off just looking for a big buck track, and then some years I didn't have time to do that, so I'd only have, like, maybe a couple weeks to go on. But it didn't seem to make any difference because um, there was big bucks around. If it wasn't no snow, then sometimes I'd go back and... Uh, or I'd go scouting. Speaking of scouting, let me talk about that for one quick second. Yeah. We were hunting over in, um, above Stratton. And I drove across the Appleton Road all the way over to the Parland Pond Road. This is years ago. This At, is Stratton, Vermont, or? Ver, no, Maine. Oh, Maine, okay. So, and the reason I did that was because we were hunting up in Gold Brook area and it started getting played out. And that's the problem. That's why we needed buses. Because, you know, if you're a successful deer hunter and you shoot three, four big 200 pound bucks out of a big basin, pretty soon the bucks are getting smaller. Yeah. They don't, because they need age. They got to be four and a half and up. So you got to find an area where the deer are old, older, to shoot big bucks because you can't shoot them if they ain't there. Yeah. I mean, you end up shooting a smaller one. Same thing happened in Ontario to us. Oh, then you bounce to another spot, and then those ones will, you know, you can go back maybe later, right? Yeah, I go back a couple of years. <clears throat> so anyways, just to show you, it was kind of played out over there in Gold Brook area in that country. So I drove over, and I scouted for a whole day over there, just hit every logging road there was. And when I got down to Parliament Pond, every logging road I drove on, there was a big buck track on it. So I went back that night and I said, hey, fellas, we're moving. It's going to take an hour and a half because we couldn't drive over on the Parlin Pond Road back then because you couldn't pass it with the buses. I had to make a big loop yeah. all the way around. I said, but it's worth picking up moving because we're going to have a lot of luck. Well, that year we had 10 guys in camp, shot seven 200-pound bucks, and the other ones were just because somebody got anxious. <laughs> <laughs> so, but everybody got one? Everybody shot a buck. Yeah. And, but... Because there was 10 guys that, you know, that came in and out of camp, and uh, we got seven 200-pounders over. What year do you reckon that was? I'm trying to remember. It was in the 80s. Now, you had a bus that was drivable, and you, and you had, had two just, buses. Two buses. Yeah. And they were just old school buses? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And you converted the inside into camps? Yeah. Yeah. And But you drove them, and you also had your trucks that, you know, you just drive in a caravan over there. Yep. I imagine that would draw some attention if people saw the two buses and a caravan of uh, Benoit's driving somewhere. <laughs> you better get over there, huh? Yeah. Really, well, you know what the problem is? Every You had to kind of hide them the best you could because people got to thinking that, well, wherever we're hunting, they got to go on too, you know? So that, that, that screwed things up a little bit, but not bad. So in that scenario, right, you'd found the, the fresh line over there. You saw a bunch of big buck tracks. You guys moved over. The very next day, you guys killed a couple of them, or did you have snow? And I don't remember, <clears throat> but we did end up having snow, and we started killing big bucks there. I mean, it was not a problem shooting a big buck. You just had to be patient and, and uh, go and do some tracking. Yeah. Actually, sometimes you didn't even have to track because it just happened to be one blunder into them. So uh, I think I read that you know your preferred scenario you like a buck that is freshly left to bed right as opposed to trying to sneak up on them while they're bedded is that right i think i read that in that book well what's what's the what's the reason for that you know do you like a, a buck who's just getting out of his bed and going to do something or are you you know walking up on him laying down i don't know where you read that i don't really care myself yeah doesn't matter not going to be acting too much different well, you know, every time you track a buck, they're all, they're all different. They're like people. Yeah. Some deer, when you start tracking them and you jump them out, I'm going to back up here for a minute. If he's fed a lot and he's laid down when you get there and you jump him up, don't see him, he's going to run away. And if you leave him alone, he's going to lay back down again because he thinks he wants to chew his cud. That's why he laid down. So... And then you're going to think that he's tired, but he's not. Just so, wants to chew his cud. Yeah, so you jump him up and he lays down again. And he wants to chew his cud again. Um, he's not tired. He's That's what he wants to do. So actually what you could do is 
if you know that's going to happen, if you think that's going to happen, if you say we fed a lot, just take your time and be real slow and don't make any noise and hopefully you can see the deer because they get a little tricky after a while. They'll make a little loop and lay down here and they'll be watching their back trail. I had a bunch of them do that through the years. But anyways, we'll go back to the question you asked me. Every deer is a little different. Some deer, the more you jump him out, the wilder he gets. Some deer get tamer. They get where they're not so nervous about you. And I think a lot of that has to do with, with the rot. You know, some big bucks get in the rut so deep they don't give a shit about you. They got one thing on mind, or two things. They either want to fight with another buck or find a doe. Yeah. And sometimes if the, uh, the first part is more they want to do with them and find a doe, they want to fight. I mean, I've tracked big bucks where that's what they want to do. So did you ever utilize calls or anything like that or rattling or making noise to make them think that you're a buck following them? Or? Well, what I rattled a lot was my 270. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never called them. Yeah. Or, no, I have called deer in, but I've never never done it much. Yeah. But you, so did you some, you'd sometimes would see them looking at the back, your, their backtrack, and if that happened, then they'd die, right? Well, I've caught them before where I found them doing that a lot. So I made a loop up around. I'd follow them a ways, and I'd figure about time. I think he's going to be watching for me. So I'd go up around the ridge like this, and I'd try to get in front of him and then come back in from behind. <laughs> and then one time I'd go up on the ridge, and I looked, and I see him coming back looking for me because I waited. And he looked up and saw me. Oops, he had that look on his face. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I've had all different things, so. Kind of fun. Tracking is the only way to go anyways. If you're capable, and you can walk five miles a day in the woods, three to five, you're capable of tracking a deer. All you need to do is have them in front of you somewhere and not have them too far away. And you can still get one tracking no matter how old you are. If you just, you just got to take your time. But when you're younger, like I was years ago, I was used to hunting in Vermont. And when you jumped a deer out in Vermont back then, they took off. They didn't look back, so you took off. Well, when I went to Maine, I didn't realize the deer were tamer up there. So I'd jump a deer out, and I'd take off after him. And he'd be standing there looking at me. i put the brakes on, <laughs> he'd turn around and wouldn't even get a shot. I had to figure that out right off the bat. I'd go, oh, these deer are different. No, that's probably because they just don't see humans as much, right? There's right. not as much interaction, so it's like they're kind of yeah. shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Who is this guy? He won't give up. But I got some long deer stories, some that... Let's go. <laughs> they were dragged out. What's your favorite one? Well, one of my favorite ones is... Um, it's on the Appalachian Trail after you left Rangeley or whatever that trail is. Is that the Appalachian Trail? I think it is. Yeah, I think so. Well, anyways, I was down in Sandy Creek there, and that's back when that range was really big out through there, and there was only one road out there. I walked out there for about an hour and a half on the trail. And then I started hunting. I found a big buck track out there. And I got a shot at him. And I got a few specks of blood. And I, I never did catch up with that deer. I ended up shooting another deer besides that one. But, but I know I hit the deer. And it was a big buck. I went back the next year because I kept thinking about that big buck that I dried a little blood on. Didn't slow him down any. I go back in the same place the next year. Geez, here's this great big buck track again. Same spot. That same little valley in there. Well, I started tracking that deer and he took me up on the top. I jumped him out up there. Heard him go. Never saw him. And he headed towards Rangeley. And he kept going and going. I'd jump him out and I wouldn't see him. He was really leery of people, this deer. No matter how quiet I was, he'd, he'd get wind of me or something. We went all the way to the lake, the next lake before you get to Rangeley Lake. There's mm -hmm. another lake there. Yeah. Went all the way from there from the Appalachian Trail. That's quite a ways. And he walked on the shoreline. Huh. And he turned and headed back on the other side of the lake in the sand. Finally, cut up into the woods. And I said to myself, uh-oh, this is not good because he's headed towards a whole bunch of deer camps over there. <laughs> going to be deer hunters all over the place. 
So I expected to hear a shot. I'd be walking along, and you see where the deer went out here, and he'd come back, and he'd go this way. And he didn't even have a clue I was behind him at that time because he was far enough ahead of me. I'd walk out, and I'd be looking around, and I'd see a guy sitting on a bank somewhere. That deer walked through all kinds of deer hunters. Never got Nobody got a shot at him. Huh. He was smart when he zigzagged his way through. He spotted every one of them. I said to myself, I'll never get this deer. He's a, he's a smart bastard. <laughs> but I'm going to stay on him. So we went up over the mountain, down the other side. I jumped him out just before we got to the top again. Didn't see him. Went down the other side. I could hear the cars going through Sandy Creek down there. All the way back now. It took all day. I could hear the cars going. And I jumped him out again over here. There was a little basin. It went like this. I could hear him running in the leaves because the snow was melted right there. Um, I could hear him going... And you know what he did? He stopped and looked back up where I was. There weren't a tree limbing away. It was like a bowling alley. And there was a tree right here. I just leaned up against the tree and went, boom. He was about 150 yards away. I didn't. I figured I hit him. It looked like I did. And I went down found him down there. Yeah. He weighed 242, his big 10-pointer. Yeah. So now I got him hung up. And I'm looking inside of his rib cage, and there's a bunch in there. On this side. I said, what's that? So I took my knife out and I poked it. Well, I heard, I felt something metal in there. I dug it out. It was a 270 bullet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was mine from there. It's the before. same, yeah, same buck. <laughs> I think That's it was. a great story. Yeah. But that deer, I never thought I'd get him. Well, I he just... avoided all those hunters because of probably that 270 bullet from the year before. Well, the thing is, after I got down there, I, lights are going by on the road down there. It started getting dark on me. I tracked him from pretty much day, you know, daylight to dark. And but yeah, it was a good buck, a big one. He yep. had no teeth in the front here. At least he was nice enough to start heading back towards where you started, right? Yeah, yeah. he just made a big loop. Yeah. So yeah. you see that they'll do that a lot when you're tracking them. Will they make big loops? Uh, if they ain't going somewhere. It's... Some of them have got some awful big loops on them. I tracked one one day for about 10 miles on my vehicle, and he was headed to the forks from three slides. How'd you track them in your vehicle? Did you just... Well, because they had loops on the Parallel Pond Road yeah. where they cut, you know, these loop roads. Yeah. And he was going... Crossing every one of them? Crossed every one of them. You couldn't, you couldn't not see his track. Yeah. Big, big track on him. I, we found him way up by three slides, if you you don't know where that is, but it's yeah. a long ways from the forks. And he was coming from west. And he kept going east. I gave up about just before dark, and I got back at 7 o'clock that night and never caught that buck. Hmm. He was headed for the, I think he was headed for the big yard down in the forks, and I got a yard down in there. Yeah, never caught up with that deer. Um, there's a couple that you didn't catch up with, right? Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of them. They'll go from here to those mountains over there. Yeah. The older ones. Oh, yeah. What, um, so what, what other stories are co coming to mind of, uh, you know, some of your favorite stories? Uh, well, one of my favorite stories is when I was a kid. Of course, I used to chase them right to death. you got to understand that. When I was a kid, I was in, I was in good shape. I could run all day. Um, I couldn't run as fast as some people, but I could run a lot longer mm -hmm. for some reason. I was built with, uh, I ain't bragging, but I was built with tremendous stamina and I could do it every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's why I shot so many bucks because, uh, I had the stamina. I had, I've had football players go with me back then and they didn't felt, they didn't fare good. <laughs> well, that's part of it, right? It's yeah. like, <laughs> I'm going to back up a little bit. So anyways, way back when we had a TV, we were on the NFL um, in intermission one time. I don't know if you know that. They had us. No, I didn't know you guys were on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, way back, they had us on there when um, that famous guy did the NASCAR races there. He had them, camera guys all show up, and we were in the intermission for NFL and the, the Super Bowl. <laughs> Believe it or not. Wow. So anyways, they brought these super good shape people that lug cameras you know because they heard they had to be in good shape 
So we're hiking around the mountains, and pretty soon this guy couldn't, he weren't keeping up. Well, he says, the battery pack is kind of heavy because he had a battery pack. And I said, well, I'll take that. Don't worry about it. So I put the battery pack on, and, and he still weren't doing good. And he says, the camera's heavy. I said, well, I'll take the camera, too. <laughs> so I took the camera, <laughs> took the battery pack, because back then the cameras had a battery pack they'd plug into. Yeah. Uh, he still weren't doing good. <laughs> so you carried him. <laughs> yeah, so we had to, uh, about 1 o'clock, we had to go back. And he just couldn't go anymore. So, so they were following. They were following you. There's their NFL cameraman or whatever, yeah. right? and they were following you. And they they showed a piece during the intermission. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So anyway, so I'm just going back to where I was because back then, when I used to get on a deer track, I took off, you know, because that's what they did in Vermont. I didn't give a shit. I don't care if I went over this mountain or not. I didn't care because see back then, and even today, this is the way it is. Say that you're ten miles away. And you come out on a blacktop road, you got a gun on your shoulder. Well, during deer season, it's easy to get a ride. Yeah. You get a ride like that. Yeah. And remind me to finish that story about being a long ways away. You're going to like the next story. All right. So anyways, I'm in Jay Peak hunting. Snowed three feet. The snow was up to my crotch. Yeah. That's how deep the snow was. So I said to myself, well, how the hell am I going to get back up in that mountain up in there, that big valley, big basin, and... Uh, all this deep snow. So I come to the conclusion, just walk up the brook. So I did. I walked up the brook. It was easy going then. Well, I get a, I get three quarters of the way up into that basin there in Jay Peak, and I look down, and here's this great big buck track crossing, you know, because you could tell in the brook, you could finally see the track. Yeah. But I notice he's uh, really dragging his chest a lot. Well, come to find out, the deer was built like a buffalo for some strange reason. He was knock kneed <laughs> his, his legs went like this and huge feet on him huh. and he's all chest and neck and a small rear end on him he built just like a buffalo hmm. only deer ever shot like that well anyway so i tracked him up on the mountain and i jumped two bucks out up there him and not another one and i began to chase that sucker as fast as i could go and i'd be shooting at him on the way down through my dad could hear me way up in the basin he looked at Uncle Wendy and says, well, he's getting closer. <laughs> Every time I'd shoot, the noise would get louder. And this is all afternoon. And finally, I, he came right down into the big swamp area down there. And the deer was getting tired because he couldn't run in it. And I was getting tired too. But it was come right down to Stanham in the end because the deer couldn't, he, he couldn't run like a normal deer because he was so short-legged. Yeah. So, getting stuck in that swamp. We got in the swamp, and he's about from here to them little trees right there, and he turned, looked at me, and charged me. The only deer ever had no to do way. that. Yeah. He went just like this. <laughs> he's I was, he's acting like a buffalo, too. Oh, he was. I said, what the? I went just like this. Boom, right there. Had his head down. Got him right there. Yeah. Right between the shoulder blades. Wow. And he landed right there. I stood there for a minute. I was so tired. I must have laid on, I fell over backwards on purpose and then just looked straight up and breathed for about 20 minutes. That's how tired out I was. <laughs> well, he, he, so he had fight or flight and he, <laughs> he was flight the entire day and then finally he couldn't take it anymore. Like, well, I couldn't hit him because I'm running and shooting out of breath. So were you running a lot during that? Oh yeah, like, I, actually ran. I ran most all afternoon, yeah. Yeah. In that deep snow, I was beat. I mean, I come out of the woods a lot of times when I was a youngster like that. My coat would weigh 20 pounds from sweat. I drank in every brook I crossed in the mountains. I was running out of, I was getting dehydrated. That's yeah. how much I was sweating. Yeah. Oh, the next story. You said uh, being a long ways away. Is that the next story? Or we can sure. come back to We can come back to that. Well, you got a question? No, no. If that wasn't the next one, we can come back to it. You can tell me. I'll remind you. Well, we'll go to that story. It was the same right. place where I shot that that two forty two. Um, the next year hunting up there. This is way back. Early eighties. No, actually it was seventies. Way back in the seventies. Um it was a sunny day and I felt like wandering. Because back then I was in such good shape it you know, I I just never got tired. So I started wandering, wandering, wandering. I kept going towards the sun in the end of the day, which was east. 
but my rig was back west of me, back towards Sandy Creek, because that's where I was parked. I was parked just above this is a um, town garage gravel pit on that entrance, and I was just up there. That's quite a hike across that <laughs> fucking mountain range. <laughs>